Welcome everyone to our NCAA Social Series. I'm Andy Katz. Here in San Antonio, I'm pleased to be joined on this episode by Jim Nance from CBS Sports, the winner of the Gerald R. Ford Award. The accolades keep coming. They're so well deserving. <laughs> no. So no, well deserving. You, uh, I was there in um, April, I guess, in New Orleans when you got the Naismith Award. Oh, that was very nice. Which, you, unbelievable speech. Uh, and you reflected back on your career calling March Madness, college basketball, which sadly for all of us will come to an end uh, from the play-by-play -play side. You'll still be around uh, at the events this April in Houston. Uh, first off, what does this award mean to you? When Mark called to tell me that I won the Gerald Ford Award, I was, I, I was trying to process uh, an award named after a, a former president from the president of the NCA. I mean, it was, it was pretty heavy. It means, it means a ton. Um, what it means is that I, I, I've thought about it a lot, is that I have seen the NCA from a lot of different levels. I guess that has something to do with it. I masqueraded as an athlete in college. I was a student athlete. I was on the golf team at Houston, even though I was at the end of the bench. I mean, maybe even a seat or two beyond the end of the bench. But it's, uh, it's one of the greatest honors I've ever received. So like any one of them, it seems a little over the top for me. I'm just doing what I felt like uh, the childhood dream uh, that was floating around on my head. That's what it was steering me toward, was just to call these games. I didn't know things like this would come along with it. Pretty cool to have an award named after President Ford, who I actually met one time, so had dinner with him. So it's, it's, it's very much appreciated. By the way, obviously a golfer as well, and sort of merging your, your worlds. With, with President Ford? Yes. I was at the Jerry Ford Invitational Golf Event in Vail. This would have been in the 90s. And I can still remember I was playing the 11th hole with my group, and President Ford came out in a golf cart and in the fairway, he goes, hey, I'd like your group to sit at my table tonight for dinner. Okay, it'd be a great honor, sir. So that night, I believe it was at the Vale Lodge. And it wasn't like hundreds of people there, but there was assigned seating at the table, round table, eight people there. I had Betty Ford to my right, and I had Bob Hope to my left. And President Ford was directly across from me as we are right now. It was probably in the din of all of that hubbub and activity. I couldn't hear him real well, or I'm sure he probably couldn't hear me. So I didn't have a lot of conversation with him. I was just honored to be sitting there. And I ended up having a conversation most of the night with Bob Hope. It's kind of cool. Well, I'm just a kid out of college, yes. like wanted to go cover some sporting events. And the next thing you know, you're sitting next to Bob Hope and at President Ford's table. I could have ever imagined that I would one day actually have an award um, presented to me that's in his name. I should have told him that night. You know, down the road, I'm going to get an award with your name on it. <laughs> that would have been a little crazy. Um, those of us that have been in these arenas for decades, uh, it's hard to convey on some of these moments. You know, I think back to 08 and Mario Chalmers and obviously, you know, uh, Chris Jenkins, Villanova. Um, you have an even better seat and you actually get to call it. Um, what has that been like to be right there courtside and have your voice be part of history on some of these great calls? Well, that's a great question. When you started knocking off some of these, these moments, Chalmers was here in San Antonio in 08. And I can remember it well, because Billy Packer was calling his last game. And I knew it was his last game, even though he had only told two of us, Bob Dekas, the producer, and he had told me. And when Chalmers hit the shot, it forced overtime. And my first instinct was, I get five more minutes with Billy. I loved working with Billy, and I didn't want it to end, but he had already predetermined he was going to retire after that game. Um, the Jenkins moment, the timeout by Michigan back in 93 by Chris Weber, who I've later on got to have a great friendship with. And uh, they all have been just gifts, you know, to be at every one of these. And it's been a lot of it, when I, a lot of memories, I bet is. When, when I left the host role at the Final Four, for five years I had served as the host while Musburger and Packer called the games. And I went into the seat next to Billy. Someone told me, you have a chance one day to set the record for most play-by-play -play calls of, of the Final Four and National Championship. And I said, what, what's that gonna take? And they said, well, Dick Inberg called it six times and Brent's called six. You have a good chance. You probably can make it to seven. 
Well, this year will be my 32nd. So <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I was just very fortunate that the contract stayed as a part of our family at CBS and in concert with Turner. And um, it's time someone else do it. You know, I've, I've loved every minute of it. If I didn't have two young children, I'd still want to do it and I would do it. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been my introduction. College ath athletics was really kind of what was in my heart first because my dad was a big college sports fan. We were raised in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, so a heavy diet of ACC basketball. And sporting events he would take me to when I was just a young lad were off, often right around you know, college basketball arenas. So, yeah, I've felt really good about my decision, but now that you've got me talking about it, I'm feeling a little maudlin at the moment here, Andy. <laughs> For those that would love to, you know, obviously get into the business and all that, what's the key to working with not just different analysts, but what you've had to do recently, which is work with two in a three-person booth? I think everyone has a different approach to it and a different style. My style as far as basketball play-by-play -play, has always been to try to be conversational. People are watching the game and we're going to converse about stories anecdotally about players or situations. Um, I'm not a big play-by-play -play caller in basketball. It's just the way Billy and I kind of developed it. And especially now having Grant and Raft three in a booth for a basketball game is moving so fast. It's a lot easier to have a conversation with a few exclamation points along the way. Oh, what a rebound. That was a dunk by Lorenzo Charles. I didn't call that one, by the way. I was in the stands for that one, but I didn't call that one. It's, um, it's a style that I think really works for TV. I don't need to make note of every pass, every rebound, it's not radio. who shoots it. It's not radio. And I think sometimes that gets overlooked by people. And it's a visual medium. So let the pictures tell the story. And if we're going to try to blend our voices with it, let the action be the story. And let's be the undercurrent to help supply the storylines. How have you seen the arc of the sport change at its biggest moment in March Madness from the early 80s now to, you know, we're exclusively in domes, obviously, since really, what, 96, I think, when we were at the Meadowlands. But that whole arc that we're at right now. Well, when I started back in the 80s with the Final Four at CBS, we were not in the one and done era. Guys stayed and played four years. Sometimes you get a guy that might leave after his junior year. Grant Hill sits next to me, an incredible ambassador for college athletics. He was one of the last superstar four-year players. Tim Duncan came a little bit after him. Uh, my first Final Four, Purvis Ellison, was a freshman. And he was the most outstanding player. In this day and age, he would have been, the next day he would have announced he's, he's heading to the draft. So it's changed in that respect. The one thing that hasn't changed is, is that people love college basketball. And people that are tied to their school still support their school, even though it's become more transient and the players come and go. They're still all in. There's still that pride and that connection with their alma mater or their team. But it's different. You know, things evolve. They're going to evolve a whole lot more. I mean, we're in such a complex time, I think, particularly with all of college athletics. Transfer portal is chaotic and it's creating issues that I don't think have bubbled fully to the surface yet. Uh, the NIL thing is a little bit unwatched and unguarded and uh, a frontier that, that needs to be probably governed a little bit more and will because we all it's not blaming anybody it's just we got to figure out how this works and how to manage that along the way but you know i think if anybody really ever wanted to say what's going to be the future of college athletics is going to survive it'll always survive as long as that school name is on the uniform if if they ended up going in a direction where you get less talented athletes. You know, we're just talking about one sport here, maybe two or three. I still think the fanaticism for the games will still be there. The Final Four will still be there. It'll survive. I come from a second, third tier sport is my background, college golf. We have no one watch us. Uh, but there's still a lot of pride. There's still a lot of competition. And um, it's a big part of what the NCAA really is. You know, we're storytellers. Every single athlete that shows up at a school has a story to tell. 
I was fortunate I had a golf coach who, who knew what my story was. I was obsessed with the idea to work for CBS one day since I was a little boy. I did not want to be a PGA Tour player. Trust me, I didn't have the skill set to even fantasize about it, but I was good enough to be on the golf team at Houston, which was a powerhouse. It was a powerhouse. But he knew my story. He nurtured that story. He gave me every opportunity to try to be able to pursue that. I would not have been able to have my career if it wasn't for my college experience as a student athlete and for a coach, Dave Williams, taking an interest in me. So, so often when we talk about college athletics, we isolate it on men's college basketball, women's college basketball, and football. There's a whole landscape, a whole world out there of other sports we got to protect, nurture, and love, and find out what those stories are for those athletes and try to draw the best out of them. So those dreams, which are every bit equally as important as the football and basketball players' dreams, their dreams are just as important. And that's, to me, what the NCAA experience is about at its very core, is making those dreams come true for these kids. One last thing, I just sort of picking up off on that, and this is not to diminish, obviously, the NFL or – the golf, the golf that you cover at the Masters and all that level. But I know your passion. I know what it means to you to call College Basketball March Madness. Um, you've got those three properties. What makes it so special to you calling College Basketball and have called College Basketball versus the NFL and golf? I think for a month, it feels like you're, and you know it, Andy, it feels like you're living in this bubble and you enter it and come out of it and you don't even realize that you actually slept somewhere in there and there were 20 some odd days during that whole experience. It felt like you were always either preparing for, watching, participating as, uh, as someone who's documenting the event and it, you're just so completely all in. It's a great feeling. It's a, I don't think there's an event in the country that feels as good as the NCAA basketball tournament. I'm gonna to miss that. I don't even know what my life's gonna be like without it. It's way more than half my life being in that bubble. And I used to get asked all the time, <clears throat> well, you do three properties, that's unusual. A lot of guys just have one major property or they might have two, but one's usually kind of, you get one sport, you stick to it. I've had three. I'm a father of three. So asking me which one <clears throat> is my favorite. It's like asking me which one's my favorite child. And just because I'm walking away from the NCA, it felt like the right time. We have an incredible group of play-by-play -play announcers who deserve an opportunity to, to make their own mark. And it's a shorter season. The NFL and covering the PGA Tour, the Masters and the PGA, those are 20-week events. I couldn't take a 20-week chunk out of my, out of my career. So CBS and I, we agreed two years ago that only because it's a shorter stint would, the, would, would March Madness be the one that I would, I would uh, step away from. And it's, it's hard, but it feels like the right time and the right thing to do. It, it does. And I'm excited for Iron Eagle. He's going he's gonna to make his own mark. Um, you know, maybe one day he'll be able to do 32 of them you know, and set the, set the new record, or 33 of them. I wish him well. I'm a big fan of, of uh, Ian as, as, a, as a person, uh, even more than I am his remarkable skill as a play-by-play -play caller, broadcaster. But I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Now, I can't wait to come back and just take it all in, bring my kids. Well, see, that's the point. Now, you've left me one last window, okay, before we go here, because I know this is important to you. And I love that you said this, and I think, I, I know you've said this before, but you said it in, um, in New Orleans. Watching one shining moment with your daughter on the court, which by the way, is unique in itself because you're technically still working and you're, you can have your child there with you. Yeah. Um, what has that meant to you to have her with you for those, whatever it is, two, three minutes where everything stands still and we're all, no interviews are being conducted, we're all watching it on the court. Uh, you're trying to get me to cry. Um, <laughs> and I will be that night. She's here today, by the way. She's getting married this year. So it's always been a part of her life is going to the Final Four, even when she was a, a baby. And we traveled her on the, on the road. So 
That is my most precious time of the year, has been for years, is that three minutes, that one shiny moment's being pumped out to all over the world, live broadcast, it's on the show, but it's also being played inside the arena, as you described it, and um, well, I'm just arm in arm with Caroline. I don't know what it's gonna be like in Houston. Uh, that's, that's still to be seen, and if I go there, I'm gonna have a hard time being able to express it right now. It'll be, it'll be tears of joy though. My gateway into the business came through the University of Houston basketball program, not through the golf team. It was just a kid on campus, everybody knew. He's the guy that says he's gonna work for CBS one day. So the athletic department gave me the chance to be the public address announcer at the, at the home games. I was 18, 19 years old and I'm telling 8,000 people to stand up for the national anthem. And I go back to my dorm room and eat in the cafeteria. Um, and then Guy Lewis named me as host of his television show as my entrance into, into broadcasting. So completely tied to that program. My roommates and I, the three amigos, we, we actually endowed in perpetuity the first basketball scholarship in Houston history. Marcus Sasser went to school in our scholarship. So that program, more than any sports team in, in any realm, is the one I'm closest to. You know, I had one moment in, in, in my career, in 92, Fred Couples won the Masters. We were college roommates. He left after our junior year and turned pro. But when we were in school, his dream was to win the Masters. My dream was to be able to broadcast the Masters. And we used to play a game of pretend. I know this sounds like you guys were college or were you in grade school? We were in college. We used to practice the green jacket ceremony. I was the host, he had just won the Masters. We would practice the interview. Two kids pretending, play acting. You fast forward to April 12th of 1992, that little scene we used to play out in our dorm room came true and the whole world was watching. It actually happened. And we had rehearsed it since we were 18 years old. Did it happen the way you said? It happened, well my voice was a quiver. It was a lot harder actually well, doing same it. Same way? Yeah, we yeah, have the whole thing. I didn't, I'm not actually the guy that put oh, the jacket right, on, that right. was Ian Woosnam. Right. But uh, thankfully I got through that show without a complete meltdown. I had a semi meltdown. And here's a big thank you for your, your thoughtfulness. Thank you, thank your questions, you. thank you. Um, as always, you can go to ncaa.org slash social series where so many amazing conversations like this one are archived. Thanks for watching everyone.